We're now almost all the way through uh, the book, Nine Things You Simply Must Do to Succeed in Life and Love by the Christian psychologist, Dr. Henry Cloud. Today, we're talking about uh, what is in the book, principle number eight, which is be humble. I have to admit that be humble of all of the principles that we have encountered seemed to me the most innately religious. It uh, resounded with words that I had heard a lot growing up in the scriptures, including the story of the Pharisee and publican, uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector, and their two prayers that Jesus told. Um, and it concluded with, for all who will exalt themselves will be humbled, and everyone who humbles themselves will be exalted. But I have to admit that I think Dr. Cloud puts a spin on humility that I had not really fully considered before and find tremendously helpful. I think it can be a distortion of the understanding of humility to think that, uh, like the two men that Jesus talks about in the Gospel of Luke passage, who were both praying, one saying, Lord, I'm miserable, sinner, help me. And the other one, well, at least I'm a lot better than the other guy. I think I'm doing pretty well, God. It would be really easy to take the, that story and the, the words that Jesus concludes with afterwards to say somehow there's a lesson that we need to uh, berate ourselves or put ourselves down in order that God will lift us up. I think that's a misunderstanding, but I think I misunderstood it still a little bit, even when I filled it in and said, unless the person admits what is, uh, what they've done wrong, what's lacking in them, they don't create any room for God's grace to fill it up and to give them new life, new spirit, new energy to start again. So that would be my kind of spiritual interpretation of what humility is. And um, I don't think it's wrong. But I think uh, Dr. Cloud lays out three other ways of thinking about humility that really make sense to me of Jesus' fundamental importance that he placed on being humble. Let me share a bit about them. First of all, uh, I think that humility is a principle about knowledge and the state of our knowledge. The story that Dr. Cloud tells uh, of the person who helped him realize how centrally significant humility is to being successful is a gentleman who was a businessman who had a soap company. It was a fairly successful but not large-scale soap company in the United States. But at one point in his career, he took the product to China where it became a huge seller and he had a billion dollar business. And Dr. Cloud uh, asked him about how it is, you know, how did he grow his business so uh, fantastically well? And the answer really caught his attention. The gentleman said, well, it really only happened because I went to China and started as a rice farmer there. What did that have to do with anything? Well, he needed to learn how it was that people in China used and interacted with soap, how it was part of their daily lives, what quantity of product they used, where they did it. And by going and working among regular everyday people, he found out something incredibly important. Most of the people who were working near him were doing their laundry once a week, and they were traveling to a common site where they were doing it off-site, and no one was doing laundry in their homes. When he investigated why, he found out that everybody's home had hard water, and the hard water uh, required more soap, made less suds, and thereby was more expensive than walking your laundry to a place where there was a supply or a source for soft water 
which made the clothes cleaner, required less soap, and was way more satisfying to see those suds come up, as we all know. So he went and talked to his chemists on staff, and they developed a product that was able to be sudsy and do the same amount of cleaning in hard water conditions. And then he went and marketed it in China, showing pictures of people doing their laundry in their homes. And it was a fantastic success. And Dr. Cloud said, it, it occurred to me that what, was, what this man identified as really critical to his success was not what I would have said. He understands business. Uh, he, he knows how to you know, monitor profits and losses, and he had good marketers. More fundamentally, it started with an act of humility. He realized that he needed to understand something that he did not know if he wanted to take his product into a different culture and country. He needed to understand not just what he knew, but what he didn't know also. Humility is not having to believe yourself to be more than you are. Humility is not having a need to be more than you are. It's also not, uh, humility is not needing to be less than you are. Humility is not having a need to be or be seen as more than you are, which means you know what you don't know. As a kid growing up, when I would do something well or receive a compliment for some, from someone, uh, talking about my parents, or maybe even receive a compliment from them, my mom would very quickly follow it up with, now don't let that go to your head. How many of you had parents who did that? Thank you. <clears throat> now, in some ways, I, I didn't know what to make of that. I felt a little bit like it was a squash on top of a bump up, bump down. But uh, I, I realized, and this helped me put it in perspective, what she was trying to do, and my father did the same thing, was to caution me. OK, you know something, and you're doing that well. But don't think you know everything, and stop realizing that you need to keep learning and keep growing. Don't make this more than it is. It's good. She did not compliment, but then don't let it go to your head. In a way, being humble in terms of acknowledging what we know and what we don't know gives us an opportunity to find out so much more about life about ourselves. It expands the horizons of the possibilities of what we can know and become. In this way, someone who's willing to learn is humble, but also potentially is opening themselves up to being exalted, learning more. Another way he talks about humility and this is a little harder to, to put your finger on uh, with a neat definition. I wish I could do a better job than this. But I think he, he's talking about humility as a principle of realistic expectations. Humility is uh, based on a root of a Latin word, which thank, thankfully uh, one of my teachers from the first service helped me learn to pronounce correctly is H-U-M-U-S. Uh, in Latin, it's, I guess, humus, humus. I said hummus, but, you know. <laughs> I like hummus, but it's humus. And uh, which means ground or earth. So being humble is being grounded, aware that you have a spot in life, that you have a certain perspective, um, and, and that we're, we're earthy. Uh, 
it means we're kind of part of, of the developing, the involving Earth. We're limited and finite. And that means failure, mistakes, ignorance, ambiguity are part of life. They're part of everyone's life. Now, I think it's hard. We live in the, the age of Facebook, um, and everybody posts on Facebook all of their best shots of everything, right? Uh, so everybody's family at their most beautiful or their most hilarious or their most exciting or adventurous or the kids doing the very best. And it kind of makes you feel like that's what everybody else's real life is like. And my husband said for an earlier generation, he said, that's, that's getting the, the letters at Christmas where everybody's family is doing perfectly. He grew up with that sense of cousins who were always doing perfectly <laughs> in his mailbox. Humility is aware that life is full of challenges and we all make mistakes and it's not defensive about it. It's aware that we learn and grow as a result of trying things, stretching ourselves, and mistakes can be some of our biggest friends. We're all human. Therefore, even successful people have had mistakes made along the way, and sometimes those mistakes are the things that have helped them grow the most. I'll uh, never forget a, a, a parishioner and a congregation way back, I, this was pretty early on, uh, was someone that I had, uh, I thought, tried to reach out to in kindness. Um, I did not know very much of, of the person's background, and um, I had invited her and her husband to talk to me about being uh, youth group leaders in our little church. And <clears throat> a few days later, I was woken up in the morning by a, a, a phone call of this woman crying very hard, and she said, uh, you know, I couldn't hardly get out of her what was happening. I said, do you want to set up a, a meeting at church? She said, I'm at church right now. Uh, this was, we didn't lock the doors of the church, so she was already in the church in the sanctuary. And I went next door and walked up to her. She was sobbing hard, and I went to give her a hug, and she wrapped her arms around me and was pounding on my back while she said, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you so much which I was really surprised by. I mean, I know I can be a little much to take sometimes, but <laughs> I had no idea that I had aroused such, such intense emotion in anybody who would give me that much thought. Um, and uh, I, I started talking to her why, what was going on, and I found out as it, as it happened that she, in a, uh, in a previous marriage, had had a husband who cheated on her with a child in a youth group. So I had touched a button that I had had no clue was there, and uh, boy, did we have an intense conversation moving forward. I learned something from that very deeply, and I'm so glad that I did. I learned very strongly that lots of times, when people are talking to us and it feels like it's coming at us, that they're actually talking out of their own story and we need to take time to find out what their stories are. I kind of learned that really important thing by stepping on a cow patch, or what do you call those things? Cow, okay. I found out something that I've never forgotten and that has sometimes called me to slow down, listen, observe more, and find out what's behind the story. We're all human and successful people know it and it helps us feel 
connected to everyone. We're all in this together. I love the uh, story at the very beginning of the scriptures of Genesis where God in seven days creates the earth and all that is in it. And at the end of each day says, God saw that it was good. And uh, at the end of the day in which God creates uh, humanity and the animals and God gives humanity care and stewardship of creation, God says it was very good. It really jumped out at me as I was thinking about this principle of humility, that God does not look at humanity and the creation and say, this is perfect. This is perfect. God says, it's good. Humility realizes that the life that we have, which is full of risk and hazard, including the hazards of making mistakes and learning and failing and trying again, that life is good. It's very good. It doesn't have to be perfect. Third thing. Humility is a principle where we find the capacity for empathy with others. Not just realizing our connectedness, we're all in this human pool of hazard and risk and growth and learning, but we're also connected because we have the ability to listen and understand and ask and find out what's going on in other people's shoes as they walk through life. Humility is the principle of empathy. When someone is coming at you in a way that is not understandable, take time to listen. You might find out that they're on a same kind of journey that you're on, only it's taking some different twists and turns, but we're all human. The scriptures from Proverbs, which uh, don't exactly mention uh, humility, I think are very, very relevant as kind of a check for oneself. The scripture from Proverbs talk about scoffers and mockers, and how scoffers and mockers are the opposite of people who are wise and, I think, humble. What do scoffers and mockers do? They, they scorn and they deride things that other people are trying to do or say and make light of them and thereby make themselves feel better, whether they've tried to do anything about it or not. Quite often, it's people who haven't tried to do anything about something that are most likely to scorn and be derisive of other people's efforts. Part of that scornfulness or scoffing and mocking is a, a defense about our own sense of inadequacy. And so uh, Dr. Cloud says one of the best ways to kind of check yourself on your humility is the way you handle feedback and correction from others and confrontation. Can you see it as a gift? Or does it make you want to bring out your inner cynic and drab back at people? He says that wise, humble people admit their weaknesses and see corrections as a gift. I want to close with a quote by Dr. Uh, Cloud. Um, because as we've been doing this series, the word successful has, has continued to kind of, I think, probably uh, bug me just a little bit. We don't actually usually talk in church about people being successful, but I want to share his perspective on what uh, the relationship is between success and humility. And this is about humility as the source of connection to others. Truly successful people are givers, period. 
Success and giving are synonyms in many ways. Non-givers end up losing their success or it caves in on itself as they inadvertently remove themselves from the larger picture of humanity. Self-serving success always implodes. Self-centered lives always create self-destructing black holes. People who are successful in life are givers. With humility, they find lessons from their own experiences and seek to connect themselves to others in ways that are giving because we're all in this journey, this good journey together. May it be so.